Welcome to Healing Touch. I am your host, Dr. Gina Miller, and I am so excited to be uh, back with you tonight uh, discussing uh, Bible study and just doing what we love to do, which is to search the scriptures uh, and to study the Word of God. Tonight, our topic of discussion is on a strong church, and we want to talk about the importance of assembling together as as a, a church and body of believers uh, with the people of God. And why is that important that we should come together and that we should worship together and that we should study the Word of God together? So we uh, first want to look at the book of Hebrews in chapter 10 and verse 24 to 25. Amen. So uh, ready? Let's read. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, and the Bible reads, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. So here in the book of Hebrews, Paul is admonishing the um, believers uh, in the book of Hebrews that they should not um, stop assembling together uh, with each other uh, as a body and studying the word of God together. That's what church is, that we come together as a body of believers and we, we study the word of God and we also bring in um, others who might be visiting into the fold by sharing with them what we believe and what we know to be true in the word of God so that they too, you know, might say, what must I do to be saved, right? They hear our testimony and they, they see uh, what God has done in our lives. And by hearing the, the words that we speak as we celebrate and that as we share you know, the goodness of God and how God has changed our lives when we come into church, that would ask, uh, would, would, would um, help others to feel comfortable to, to come to us and ask, well, you know, how is it that you came to know um, this way of salvation and how is it that you came to know this way of living and, and tell me how you know, being a believer and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior has changed your life. And when someone comes to you and, and asks you uh, that earnest question, then we have to always be ready to to give a response, to, you know, always be ready to give an answer as to why you believe, you know, what the Word of God says, that it is true. Amen? And that's what it is. Um, uh, and that's what it means to uh, be a strong church, you know, because the church is is us. You know, we are the church. So we want to always be striving to be strong in the Lord, you know, and in the and in the power of his might, as the scripture tells us to. So we want to talk about being a strong church or what is a strong church. Right. And the practice of assembling with the church is important that you as you uh, come to know more about the Lord and as you study the Word of God that you uh, once you become saved that you are connected with a church that is a strong church that is going to encourage you to study the Word of God as in 2nd Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 um, the Bible says that we should study to show ourselves approved unto God, that we would be workmen that don't, that we not need to be ashamed, but that we would rightly divide the word of truth. Okay, when I say workman, it means you know, man, woman, boy, or girl. That you would be a person that would study the word of God, so that you would be able to explain and give a, a sure account of why you believe what you believe because you know this to be true 
as per the scriptures and what the word of God is saying in your life. Amen. That you're not stumbling over your answers when someone asks you, why are you saved? Or what must I do to be saved? Amen. So <clears throat> also the practice of, of assembling with the church is important, right? As we read in Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25. And naturally, we hope that the congregation we assemble with is a strong one, right? We, we hope that, you know, when we uh, connect ourselves with a church, that that church is a strong church, amen? But um, such may not always be the case, right? Sometimes the church that we are connected with is not as strong as we would hope it would be. Does that mean that you should run and, and go find another church? No, because everywhere you go, you're going to find some something that you feel is not quite, you know, up to par or what you believe should be. But we should not do, you know, we should not be running around um, leaving and, and running scared every time we see something that we don't know or don't understand. Because if we do that, then we'll always be running. Because everywhere you go, you're always going to find something that may not be to your liking. But that doesn't mean that you're supposed to run away from it. Maybe, you know, there are things that you think you see that are not so correct. You know, the reason why you're seeing it is because maybe the Lord wants for you to pray about that situation for that congregation. So that you can be, you know, become a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. Because if you see something that you think is, is maybe not so correct or, or not up to par, and all you do is talk about the problem, then you're not you know, helping you know, in any way. Then you also become a part of the problem because we have to come together and, and lift one another up, hold each other up in prayer. So if I'm a part of this church and, and this church is a part of my life, then I should be, um, you know, committed to praying for God's will to be done in the life of every person that is a part of this church, that God's will would be done uh, in the life of the pastor, you know, who is the, the shepherd, the angel over the house of, of that congregation that we should be praying for him, that God would continue to direct his path, that he would continue to be committed and stay in the face of God, studying the word of God. So God would give him what he would have for us to, to hear on every given day that he comes to preach the word of God to the people. Because if we don't pray in, in that vein and to that, to that end, then whatever we get, you know, it's because that's what we put into it. You know, we, we have to hold up the man or woman of God who is teaching or preaching the word of God in that church. Because if we don't do it, who else will? And sometimes the leader of, of any congregation can become overwhelmed or become so burdened with different situations and issues, administrative issues that might come up with the church you know, may um, be weighing them down. So it's up to us to be uh, holding up the, the leader of the church so that God would direct him to show him what to do and which way to go. And also that God would direct that leader to be able to appoint people who are um, skilled and talented in the administrative areas so that the leader of the congregation can spend more time committing himself to prayer and studying the word of God so that he can uh, feed the congregation, feed the flock, um, what the Lord would have for that congregation to hear on any given day that he is ministering the word to the people. And, and that, you know, is a very important part of a strong church, that a church that prays you know, it's it's not just a saying or cliche. We say it, it rhymes, it sounds, you know, like a cliche, but it's true. The church, the the or the this the cliche is the family that prays together, stays together. 
but I'm going to replace that word church, family rather with church and say the church, the church family that prays together stays together. And that is very important for the church to be a strong church, that we remember that, that we have to hold each other up in prayer, especially the leader of the church. Amen. And so um, um, in New Testament times, uh, there were many good congregations, you know, um, but some were not what they should have been, right? When we look at um, the New Testament congregations from the book of uh, Matthew, um, even to Revelation, um, the Bible speaks of the different types of, of groups of, of people that um, Paul especially ministered to, um, starting from the book of Acts, actually. Uh, where, you know, the people, you know, were lacking in certain areas. And so he sent teachers and he sent those evangelists and preachers and he gave some, you know, um, um, a little bit of food and then he gave some milk and he gave some meat and he gave some, you know, as they grew up, they, he gave them, you know, maybe some mashed potatoes and pablum, you know, so to speak. And I'm speaking of different levels of... Um, of uh, insight and, and teaching of the Word of God because sometimes they couldn't handle, you know, the really, you know, heavy meat of, of the things of God. So you have to first slowly, you know, feed them in small um, doses, you know, uh, the basics of what it means to be a Christian and then let God, you know, continue to water those seeds that are sown so that they can grow in the scriptures and in the word of God and get stronger in their faith. And that's what we all need is to be as strong as we can be in faith so that we will continue to believe and trust in God to help us to be a strong church. Amen. So in Revelation chapter 2, we're going to read Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4. Speaking of the um, different churches that were spoken of, right? In verse 2, chapter 2, verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And in, in this uh, scripture in Revelation, this is um, the message to the uh, church of Ephesus. And uh, in the book of Revelation... The scripture says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. So there were some um, churches in the New Testament time that, as we see here in the book of Ephesus, I mean, the, in reference to the church of Ephesus, that was not so strong. Amen. And in verse 14 to 15, this is a message to the church at Pergamos, and that scripture in 14 and 15, it reads, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Then in chapter 3 and verse 2, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. This was the message to the church at Sardis. And then in verse 15 to 17, the message to the church at Laodicea. The scripture reads, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And this was a message to the church at Laodicea. 
So we see these examples in uh, the book of Revelation that there were some churches that were not what they should have been. Amen. Now, uh, what then is the measure of a strong church? What is a strong church? Some might consider it on the basis of the building or the lack thereof of a building, um, the number of programs or classes or et cetera that might take place in the church, how smoothly that it runs as an organization with its committees and departments, et cetera, how smoothly do the things that go on in the church, you know, go on. Some might measure the um, church's strength based on those things, right? But a congregation can have all of these things and still be dead. They can have good organization, they can have good committees and, you know, good programs, but they can still be spiritually dead. They have strong administrative um, talents and and skills and can you know produce very nice programming but spiritually that church is dead and a church that is spiritually dead is a church where no one is getting saved that people are just coming attending church and it's you know somewhat can appear to be now a social club but they're not, you know, spiritually, they're not growing. They're not coming and getting saved and learning what it means to be a Christian. What is it to be saved? To be saved is to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, to be saved from sin, death, hell, and the grave. You know, to be one that have acknowledged I am in need of a Savior, that Jesus died for my sins, that God sent him that he came, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe on him would not perish and have everlasting life. So one individual who recognizes that if I don't um, have Jesus uh, as my savior, that I'm lost and going to hell. And so I am, am praying that God would save my soul. I ask the Lord to please save me, come into my life and, and deliver me from the death of this body, you know, the the end that is near for me and written that because of the sin that has entered the world, that I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity, and that if I don't have a Savior, which is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that came into the world to sacrifice himself and gave up his life, and that he gave up his life so that I would have life and that I don't believe on him and if I don't believe on him I will not have everlasting life not only did he come and die for my sins but just as the scripture says he rose from the dead on the third day and that he is now at the right hand of the father and he is praying for me and that he is also coming back again and when he comes back again that he is going to take me and those who remain to be with him forever where we be with the Lord. Now, before that he came back, he said he was going to send the comforter and that is the Holy Spirit would come, that the Holy Ghost would come into the world and that the Holy Ghost would fill the believers so that that would be the mark and that would be the, the sign that we are his, that we are filled with the spirit of God. And when he comes back, he's coming back for those people who are the blood washed believers filled with the spirit of God. And that is the church. And when he comes back for that church, that we will be caught up to be with him and, and, and the Lord is going to just come with a shout, with the, the, the voice the, of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And all those that, that um, are remaining alive will be caught up to meet him in the air. That's what the scripture tells us. And what a glorious day that will be. 
That is the, the desire of a strong church that we continue to teach the scriptures and what the word of God says about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for his church. So while we're still here, while we're still going to church and, and witnessing to each other and to our friends and to our neighbors and family members, telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ, it is our goal. It should be our desire that everyone that we meet, everyone that we know, will also become a part of the church of the body of Christ. Now, the body of Christ is made up of a whole lot of different, you know, people that have different uh, talents, skills, and, and, and strengths and weaknesses. And so it is our goal that we would come together as a body of believers and ultimately, our goal should be to, to develop into the strong church that God would have for us to be. And that is a church that is continuing encouraging one another, lifting each other up, and, and working toward adding to the body of Christ. The strong church is the church that continually prays and works toward that goal to add to the body of Christ. Amen. Because the Lord is soon to come. He is, he is, I mean, the only thing, there's nothing actually preventing from him from coming because he said he's going to send the comforter and he did so on the day of Pentecost, right? Acts 2.38, that the people were filled, you know, that were in that room praying. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they all the, the um, fire the tongues rested upon all of them and they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance. So the Holy Ghost has already come, all right? And there is nothing to prevent the Lord from coming back and receiving his church to himself that we will all be caught up to be with the Lord. So that means that he can come back any day, any day. And so since that is true, then the strong church would be the church that will continue to teach that truth, will continue to encourage others to become believers of the Lord Jesus Christ and be filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost so that you too will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's the strong church that is continuing to encourage others that you too can be saved, that you too can be delivered from whatever that what is ailing you and and what is bothering you mentally nothing that is bothering you mentally or physically is even close to the to the depth of the agony of being dying in your sins being one that never sees the lord that never will ever get to heaven but that you will die in your sins because you rejected the lord jesus christ and will die and go to a burning hell. Hell is not made for man. Hell is made for the devil and all of those angels that defected in heaven when Satan, Lucifer, before he became Satan, when Lucifer came up against God and thought that he would be like God and he was cast out of heaven. So that's that's who hell is made for and the lake of fire is made for. It's not made for man. And that's why God sent Jesus into the world. He said he sent his only son that whoever would believe on him would not perish or have but have everlasting life. And the reason why he did that is because he wanted to make a way of escape for you. Because when Adam uh, sinned in the garden... And Eve took of the, the fruit, and Adam took of the fruit as well. That was the beginning of the, um, the sin entering into the world and the separation, the separation of Adam from the Father, from God. And then he was also cast out of Eden. But God didn't just leave him there. He didn't just leave him in that state you know, with no um, solution and no recourse. 
the solution and the recourse for Adam and for Eve and as for all mankind is that you would accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you would believe that God sent his son to die for your sins so that you, once believing on his son, receiving that truth that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he was born of a virgin and that he died and that he rose again and that he is now sitting at the right hand of the Father and that he sent the Holy Spirit to fill the life of the believer, to fill the soul, the spirit of your, your, your sin sick soul, accepting Jesus Christ and then filled with the Holy Ghost will be saved. And that that saved soul will be caught up to meet him in the air when he comes back for the church. And that's who the church is. The church is the bride of Christ. So that when he comes back for the bride, for the church, that we will be pure and that we will be ready to receive him. Amen. For him to receive us because we are filled with his spirit, born of his spirit and washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. That is the story of the strong church. That we are blood washed and that we are Holy Ghost filled and that we are waiting for his appearing. Just waiting. We await, Lord God, your return so that we will be caught up to meet with you in the air. And that is what comprises us of a strong church and because we are so happy to be in the body of Christ you have to say that you will tell somebody else how could you let your your sons your daughters and your 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 family members and your friends you know just walk around and and you not ever tell them that Jesus saves and you say you love them if you say you love them and you know that they have not received the gift of salvation and accepted the Lord into their life and that if they die today or tomorrow that they are not going to heaven then you have a debt to pay you have a price to pay that you must that you owe them and that is that you must tell them that god sent his son into the world that they would be saved and that they would not perish but have everlasting life so you are the church and you are a strong church if you are witnessing for the Lord and telling others that Jesus saves. So now we're going to have to close. And, you know, I'm sorry that we were not able to get into um, more scriptures, but we will come back again. We'll continue this discussion because we want to make sure that we completely study these scriptures and, and, and delve into this topic of a strong church so that we can say with assurance that what must I do to be saved? Did I tell somebody what they must do to be saved? Yes, I did. What did I do? That I studied to show myself approved unto God, that I would be a workman that would not be ashamed, but I would rightly divide the word of truth, and that I would tell you what thus saith the Lord. So you have been watching Healing Touch, and I welcome you next week, Thursday at 8 o'clock, on BronxNet Channel 70, tune in again, where we will continue the discussion on a strong church. God bless you, and good night. One healing touch, just one touch of his love.